Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome to the Salty Science Podcast. So, I've designed Salty Science to be a podcast that is more of a casual and laid-back glance at different marine science topics, rather than an in-depth, detailed, and scientific discussion. And that's because I want everyone who loves the ocean to be able to enjoy this podcast without having to feel like you need to go back to school to understand what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, and with that said, I'll also be cutting back on some of the jargon, but there will be times when I just can't get around it, so I'll try to make sure I give plenty of explanations and definitions. And also, my goal in each episode is to relate the topics to you, my listeners, so that by the end of each episode, you can answer the question, So why should we care? All right, with all that said, let's get into our topic, which is sea salt, or rather the salt that's found in the ocean. So I thought that this topic would be great for the first episode because one, well, the name of this podcast is Salty Science after all, and two, the fact that we have a salty ocean is such a big deal for so many physical, chemical, and biological processes that it's super important for us to all have a good foundational understanding of the salt that's in the ocean. Okay, so one of the first questions that comes to mind when I say sea salt is, what the heck is sea salt? And is it the same thing as just regular table salt? So let's back up a little bit and first ask, what is salt? Besides just something that makes our food taste really good. So in science, a salt is a chemical compound that is made up of these things called ions. And ions are basically atoms or a combination of atoms that have an electrical charge. And the big takeaway here from all of this is that they have an electrical charge. Remember that because it's super important for the rest of this discussion. And so they have a charge and that charge can be either positive or negative. And a good way of thinking about this is to relate it to magnets. If you ever played with magnets, you know that opposites attract, right? So positive ions are attracted to negative ions, and when they get close enough, they stick together, similar to the way magnets will stick together. But when the ions stick together, their charge gets neutralized. And so that's a pretty basic description of what a salt actually is. Okay, so let's go to another good question. Is regular table salt the same thing as sea salt? Well, actually, the answer is a little complicated. And that's another reason why I chose this as our first topic. So you may have heard table salt referred to as sodium chloride. And that's because those are the two main ions found in table salt. Sodium is the positive ion and chloride is the negative ion. And when they come together, they form the solid compound called sodium chloride. Pretty simple, right? And if you were to take a teaspoon of table salt and stir it in a glass of just regular drinking water, the only ions present floating around in the water would be sodium and chloride. Or at least there should only be sodium and chloride. But sometimes the companies that sell us the table salt, they add anti-caking agents and other additives to the mixture. But in theory, it would just be sodium and chloride. But if you were to go out and collect a glass of seawater, yes, there would be sodium and chloride ions, and actually there would be a lot of sodium and chloride. But seawater also has so many other ions floating around in it as well. And there are about 11 ions that show up regularly in seawater all around the world. And those are sodium, chloride, sulfate, magnesium, calcium, potassium, and bicarbonate, as well as bromide, borate, strontium, fluoride, and silicate. And here's a fun side fact. If you were to collect water from all five oceans all around the world, you would find those 11 ions in every sample of water and all in the same proportion. For example, if you were to collect a kilogram or a thousand grams of seawater, which basically comes down to about a liter of water, of that kilogram or liter of seawater, about 96.5% of the weight or mass of that water would just be from regular the water molecules itself, and about 3.5% would be due to the ions that are floating in the water. And of that 3.5, just collective percentage, 55% would always be due to the chloride ions, and about 30% would always be from the sodium ions, and 7% from sulfate, and 3% from magnesium, and about 1% from calcium, and another percent from potassium. And actually, even if you have less salty water or more salty water, the percentage of the ions will always be the same. And in marine science, we call this the constancy of composition of seawater. 
and we've actually known about this since the 1800s. And in marine science, we also take advantage of this concept, because if we can determine the concentration of one ion, say chloride, we can then determine the concentration of all of the other ions and therefore calculate the overall concentration of salts in the water. And we do, and I have, and I've personally actually have done this in a lab during my undergrad program at Stockton University in New Jersey. And here's another fun fact for you that I've kind of already alluded to by just saying the word salts in the plural term rather than the singular. And that's because seawater is a bit different than just taking a spoonful of regular table salt and, dis and dissolving it into some water. And that's because if you dissolve some table salt in water, like I said before, you should only have just sodium and chloride. But if you take a glass of seawater from the ocean and let the water just evaporate out, you not only have the salt sodium chloride, but you'd also have the salts calcium carbonate, gypsum, magnesium chloride, and potassium chloride. And again, we get all of these different salts because of the different positive and negative ions that are matching up and sticking together to form a solid salt. And so this leads me to my next question. How much salt is actually in the ocean? Well, I actually looked this up online and in a couple of my oceanography textbooks. And according to my resources, the world ocean contains about 5.5 trillion tons of salt, which would mean that if all the water in the whole ocean, which covers roughly 70% of the earth, if it was just, if all the water was just to suddenly evaporate, the salt residue that would be left behind would be so large that you could literally cover the entire planet with a layer of salt 150 feet thick. Or if you prefer the metric, that would be a layer of salt 45 meters thick. That's a whole lot of salt. Which then leads me to my next question. Where did all of this salt come from? Well, one source is from the rocks on land. And that's because every time it rains, the rainwater will slightly erode some of the rock away, releasing minerals and ions, which then get washed into the ocean either by rivers or other runoffs. Another way that the salt gets into the ocean is by underwater volcanoes and hydrothermal vents, which release salts and ions into the water as well. And finally, another source is from what we call in marine science atmospheric deposition. And a good way to visualize what atmospheric deposition is, is to think of a volcano. And that volcano erupts and it releases rocks and minerals and ions into the air that then get deposited into the ocean. That's one form of atmospheric deposition. But there's a couple others, but we won't get into that right now. Okay, so why do we care about the different salts in the ocean? Well, one of the main reasons is because it changes some of the physical properties of the water. For instance, remember when I said that salts are made up of ions which have either a positive or a negative charge? Well, when they're in their solid form, they're sticking together and that charge gets neutralized. But when they're dissolved in the water, the water molecules are preventing them from sticking together. So they're just free floating with their positive and negative charges in the water. And what that means is that the water is now able to conduct electricity. And in marine science, we also take advantage of this. Because the more free-floating ions or dissolved salts in the water, the more it can conduct electricity. And in many labs that I've worked in, we've used a sensor that we place in the water that will actually measure an electrical current. And then with some fancy equations, we're actually able to determine the salt concentration or salinity of the water. And did you know that you can actually make a light bulb shine using salt water? So I found this really neat DIY experiment from homesciencetools.com that provides you with all of the instructions to make this happen. And guess what? For all of my listeners, I've posted the link to this experiment on the Salty Science Patreon page if you want to try it out for yourself. And I'll actually be posting a video of me doing this experiment on the Patreon page really soon. Okay, so another way that salt changes water is that it changes its freezing and boiling point. So pure water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, or that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, salt in water changes this, and the more salt, the bigger the change. And probably the most obvious of the two is the freezing point. If you've ever lived in an area where it snows, you'll notice that most people start putting salts on the roads and sidewalks and driveways, and that's because the salt acts like a type of antifreeze. And so in the ocean, 
the water won't freeze at zero degrees Celsius. But in fact, average seawater freezes at negative two degrees Celsius, or that's 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which definitely impacts a lot of marine ecosystems, especially near the North and South Poles. And before I get to the next bullet point in my notes, I have a quick question. Have you ever been told by your parents or grandparents or even a cookbook to add a little salt to a pot of water before trying to bring it to a boil? Well, that's because the salt is actually reducing the water's heat capacity, which basically means that the water will heat up faster. So the next time you want to make some pasta, by adding some salt to your pot of water, it's supposed to help speed up the time that it takes the water to come to a boil, thereby speeding up the cooking process, and it'll also add a little flavor to your food as well. Okay, and another way that salt changes water is that it decreases the water's speed of evaporation which is also kind of related to the positive and negatively charged ions and the fact that every water molecule also has a positive and a negative charge to it. But what does this mean in a practical sense? Well, one example would be that if you went swimming in the ocean, it would take you longer to drip dry than it would if you swam in a lake or a river. That's kind of useful information, actually, now that I think about it. And then another thing that the salt does is it changes the water's viscosity, making it more viscous. Which a great way to think about viscosity is, imagine you're at your favorite diner or restaurant and you order a plate of pancakes and a cup of coffee. In your coffee, you pour some cream or some half and half, and on your pancakes, you pour some good old-fashioned maple syrup. And so my question is, which one's easier to pour? Well, if you use the same type of syrup that I use, the cream would be way easier to pour because it always feels to me like I have to wait a really long time for the syrup to come out of the jar. And that's because the syrup has a higher viscosity than the cream. So now the viscosity between the salt water and the fresh water may not be as extreme as the difference as cream and syrup, but the difference can make a huge difference between some of the animals and organisms that live in the water, as well as the way the water moves in the ocean, such as with currents and eddies. But we'll save that fun for another episode. And finally, adding salt to water changes water's density, which this is such a big deal that I don't even want to go into this right now because, because this topic deserves its own episode. Okay, So understanding the salts in the ocean is so important because of all the ways that it changes the physical properties of the water, like the ones I just mentioned, but also because it impacts different physical, chemical, and biological processes that go on in the ocean. And all of these, in one way or another, impacts our own lives, whether directly or indirectly. And we'll definitely be getting into these in more detail in future episodes. Okay, so that's the end of my notes. So as a quick summary, in this episode we covered the definition of salt according to science, as well as the different ions and salts that are found in the ocean. We also discussed a little bit about how much salt is in the ocean and where it all came from. And we also discussed some of the ways salt can change the properties of water, which has huge physical, chemical, and biological impacts. Alright, so now I have a challenge for all of my listeners. After listening to this episode, I challenge you to answer in your own words the question, why should we care? That is, why should we care about all of the different salts and ions in the ocean, especially if being a marine scientist isn't your day job? So that's your challenge, and if you'd like to share your answer with me, I'd love to hear it. And you can send me your answer via email at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. All right, so that includes this episode. So until next time, have a great day, great week, and remember to stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to the Salty Science Patreon page, where I've posted some really cool videos, some study notes, as well as some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram. My username is Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and YouTube, plus another of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener-supported. So if you would like to show your support, 
visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount, or you can become a Salty Science crew member for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon page and sign up today.